Good morning. Today's morning with me, but I'm going to be talking about data visualization, jumping off from my most recent blog post. So the census just released the official enumeration of the population of the states plus Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico. Um, but we don't care about D.C. and Puerto Rico because what I care about is the apportionment of the 435 representatives in the House of Representatives. And I had done some visualizations in March about a month ago, and I've upped, you know, I've revamped some of those for 2020. So one of the visualizations I did was this animated shift of a tile grid map um, where you can see a little bit of the movement of how many reps each state has. And I'm using the tile grid map uh, partly so you can see the smaller states, the geographically smaller states, but also because, of course, the size of the states really have very little to do with the population. And I really just care about the number of representatives. Uh, using a choroplast is really not appropriate for this use. Um, and it makes it really easy to see when you animate it going from decade to decade, where it shifts in 1910, kind of from the middle Northeast, Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York being highest, and then shifting down over the century to California, Texas, and Florida, which are now the top three. Okay, so this is the graph that I really like because this is partly me arguing that there should be more representatives in the House of Representatives. Most of the time, the objection I have heard from people to uncap the House, oh, there's not enough speech for people in the Capitol. Well, I don't care. Uh, in the House of Commons in the UK, they definitely don't have enough seats for the numbers of uh, members of Parliament. But more to the point, I really don't care about building capacity when we try to figure out how many representatives there should be per you know amount of population. So I had made a box plot which shows the uh, distribution by each decade going back to 1910 and because I did it this way because it's 435 representatives each time. Obviously the population of the United States has been growing so the average for the population per representative of course just keeps growing for the whole country. It started around 200,000 and now it's pushing well it's 760,000 some um, for the average. What the box plot does I'll be jumping off this in a moment. The box, the line you see kind of in the middle is where the median falls. Um, I may have put the X in there for the mean, but you can barely tell where that X is just because, well, let's, let's zoom in. Yeah, you can, in some of these, you can see where the X is. Sometimes the X is right on top of the median. Sometimes it's not. Um, in any case, the ends of the boxes go from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile. And then there's what's these whiskers. So this is a box and whisker plot, which is, you know, kind of doing tails out. And it takes that distance between the 25th and the 75th percentile and extends it 150%. Um, it's, it's kind of arbitrary, but this is a way to capture where are outliers. And so then you'll see the points past those whiskers are considered outliers. And we can see kind of how much it, it differs unsurprisingly, because every state has at least one representative. The lowest number, so lowest number of people per representative tends to be the smallest population state that exists. Um, and I believe that is, actually, I'm not sure what that is right now. Um, in any case, uh, so you can kind of see the growth in the population of whatever is the smallest state. Um, I'd have to have my spreadsheet to actually look. I, you know, maybe it's Delaware or something like that, or Rhode Island. In any case, um, and then we have our top level. And that usually also is a state with either one or two representatives, the way these things are allocated out. Um, in the 2010 census, this dot up here was Montana, and it's almost a million. And I think actually, so that isn't, I 
think that's Delaware for the 2020 census. Montana managed to uh, luck out and get an extra rep, um, get two reps in 20, the 2020 allocation. In any case, the reason I bring up the box plot is because just yesterday I received this book. Yes, it's used. It's from 1969, Practicing Charting or Practical Charting Techniques by Mary Eleanor Spear. And she, let's go to her Wikipedia article, is known for inventing or developing the box plot, which I just showed you. So we have the median, first quartile, third quartile, that's the 25th and 75th percentiles, and the median is the 50th percentile. Um, so 50% of the data are above and 50% below. Um, the minimum, okay, so the the whiskers can go down to the minimum up to the maximum, but these aren't really the true minimum and maximum. This is not uh, really uh, labeled well. In any case, you take that interquartile range, you extend these whiskers based on that interquartile range, which is from the 25th to 75th percentile, um, and then points outside that range are considered outliers. So she invented that. So you may wonder, okay, what kind of graphs are in this book from 1969? And it took me a while to find a reasonably priced uh, copy. Some, a lot of technical books um, are out of print from the original because they're not useful today. They're only, a lot of people see them only as useful to the extent you learn the history and the development of the particular field or the particular practice. So the, the thing is, all of the graphs in the book are hand-drawn. Now, obviously, you're using drafting, you know, um, you know, you've got straight edges, you've got protractors, you've got some precision drawing uh, materials, just like architects do and engineers. Um, so I'm going to show you, I mean, these are hand-drawn, all of these. Every single chart in this book. And you go to, there's a table of charts, of figures, and I don't know how many because the way she numbers them, of course, are by chapter. So you can kind of see here's the first page of the figures, uh, pages two and three. Yeah, it, it just keeps going. She has a lot of examples because the whole point of this book is to show different choices for communicating your results and numbers. Because when you were doing data visualization, because you had to draw it by hand back then, your whole point was you were going to be trying to communicate these results in an effective way to an audience. Uh, because she mentions, I mean, you can have tables of numbers. Tables of numbers, very, very easy to type set. You can type them out, yada, yada. Maybe you could even use a computer back then. I don't know. Um, however, you take that table and you want to make graphs with it. Well, you got to do that by hand. Now, it gives you an idea of the limits on precision, and a lot of times people get a little too hung up on the technology of data visualization. Uh, too many of the data visualization websites I go to, um, and so, I mean, I don't really have a beef against Tableau, or R, absolutely not. Uh, ggplot, and then there's, of course, Python, has a whole range of tools people have developed for data visualization, and some are easier to use than others. That's not the issue. Um, the For R and Python and Tableau, they've really come up with some very nice looking palettes. They've come up with a lot of defaults that are very nice looking, but because of their power, they also let you do some really ugly stuff very easily. And because it's kind of, it's not costless, but it's almost costless in terms of the amount of time it takes you to make the graph, a lot of people are making really awful graphs because it's too easy. Um, and, and as Stuart would say, you know, Socrates would be disappointed. This had to do with me forgetting something I used to have memorized. Um, just as it used to be a very elite skill to be able to read and write, uh, and it's not anymore. Um, you could say it's too easy for people to do that. I mean, this is the biggest beef against Excel spreadsheets 
is that it's too easy for people to use. And so they usually, they do often misuse it. And that is true. Um, I don't hold it against the people of limited skills though. And I don't hold it against the Excel developers. I do hold it against uh, people who do know better and don't put in controls and don't promulgate good practices themselves. Uh, this is just like teachers uh, refusing to promulgate good written style, uh, good written grammar to their students because it, it's not instinctual. You have to be taught this stuff. It's not necessarily difficult, um, but a lot of people just don't think about this. Now, what, what is just fabulous to me, just as in, in another book I'm about to show you, there's a list of uh, resources that you can use if you want to make uh, graphs yourself. Uh, Spear puts a whole list of basically art supply companies that have, um, yeah, art and drafting supplies so you can make nice graphs. I saw Coinor in here. I love their pencils. Um, I also see Faber. They've got uh, lovely color pencils, I know. Um, <coughs> sorry. And also projection and display equipment. Uh, because she does talk about the practicalities of like putting it on a poster board versus um, projecting it. And yeah, so folded posters, um, you know, that there's just lots of different things that are being used. And this is a very broad version of charting. So we see stuff like, let me see if I can show it. So a map and personal photos connected to a map. So this is marketing experts that are tasked to different areas of the United States. That's what that was. Um, so different kinds of map charts. And actually, this was really cool. I liked this. Using a non-standard projection of the Earth to show, um, let's see, is this the shipping? Well, kind of to show the flow of materials into the United States to manufacture certain goods. In any case, I am going to be going through this because she is developing, she is going through uh, a dictionary of graphs that were drawable by hand. And think about it, visualization was, was art. I mean, it was a craft. Um, and it should still be looked on as a craft with a set of skills you should learn. So this is not going to be helpful to you if you really want to develop graphs now, okay? That is fine. Um, I have my own purposes, and I, I always love looking into uh, the history of stuff. So one of the things I want to do, and I may do this, is um, as to officially publish it. I'm working on, I've got my materials, but working on republishing uh, Edmund Halley's uh, monograph on trying to calculate annuity values using uh, what they knew about deaths in Breslau, I think it was. Um, and he really developed on uh, how to make those basically actuarial present value calculations for annuities, which were paid, I think, annually at the time. Um, and I want to republish that and other classic kind of science and actuarial text. Uh, the other ones I'd, I'd love to do is Woolhouse's publications. I also have an old uh, book of what every person should know about life insurance. And this is from the mid-18, it's actually pre-Civil War, U.S. And this was a little booklet given to the, um, the sales women. And I'm going to emphasize, this was a booklet for women to use in selling life insurance because I, I believe it says at the bottom by a lady i don't really care it was by the marketing group basically of mutual of new york if i remember correctly um a mutual insurance company from new york state in new york city and it has so many tables but it it it's got poetry it's it's got so many amazing things and I am thinking of, you know, doing an ebook version of it plus some annotations so you can understand what the equivalent in like today's mortality tables would be. Anyway, let's go to the modern age. And this is another book that I recently bought, uh, Better Data Visualizations by Jonathan Schwabish. Um, now, Jonathan Schwabish runs a, a website called PolicyViz, and he's a 
data visualization person who does a lot of stuff for the Urban Institute, like helping them set up their style guide. And I, I'm not quite sure exactly what role he has other than um, he really helps them make better visualizations. And the Urban Institute has great visualizations like The Economist. Bloomberg is iffy, but there's there's a different thing going on with Bloomberg. There are various or organizations that really seriously do some very serious data visualizations. New York Times tends to actually have some good ones, um, especially the interactive ones online. But The Economist, uh, they have to make it work online and in print. Um, and they have some very good data visualizations in any case. Sorry. Um, so what's great about his site, so here's policyviz.com. He has a variety of examples, you know, so here's some, here's some things, but this is the great thing. You see this graph right here. A lot of the graphs, and I will go back to my blog post because one of the graphs on there is something I took that he made years ago and I have adapted for my own uses over time and I do kind of need to build a whole suite um, around this so that I have you know my tools and this is kind of the point the technology makes it easy for us to generate graph after graph because we don't have to do it by hand okay um, but we do get kind of sloppy and a lot of us use the defaults that are built into whatever system we use whether it's excel or something else so what we have here percent of gdp and and this this is a graph that could be built in excel there's nothing special about it it's a line graph with the zero axis here emphasized you can do this there's no big deal here so here is a line graph and the whole point of this is do you want to emphasize that zero line or not? So here it's emphasized and here it's not. For this specific purpose, year to year change in US healthcare spending, marking out zero is important because this is a percentage change. So positive means it's increasing. And then obviously if it falls below that zero, that means it decreased. Or if it hits the zero, that means it, you know, it just stayed where it was. So, you know, sometimes there are important parts in the graph that you want to visually emphasize by just making a thicker line. And those are the kind of practical things that are in both of these books um, about the choices you make that can make it easier. And this is about communicating results. There's another use for data visualization I'm not talking about right now. But the really important one that if you are a numbers person that you need to learn you need to learn how to communicate effectively and i would say effective data visualization techniques is one of those so this is a good book now the issue is again there are multiple tools that are displayed in here and at the end sorry let me get to the end he does talk about different resources um different uh sorry different tech choices here we go yeah this is do they have excel on here oh there's excel <laughs> okay and i'm just i'm just showing you this a lot of people have a version of this graph around about a kind of how easy things are to use uh if you are trying to create a graph but also kind of how complicated it can get a lot of the stuff that you can do in R and Python and Tableau, you can do in Excel, sometimes not easily. Uh, but in some of the cases, it's a matter of, say, multiple graphs getting created. And if you create a template, if you create um, a spreadsheet, you can reuse to get the kind of graph you want. So I'll give you an example, which is a Corellogram, which is basically a matrix of scatter plots. Well, Excel can do scatter plots, but what it doesn't do is this nice little matrix. If you do a linear uh, fit in the, um, what is it, stat pack, analysis pack, whatever. Um, I don't use it too often, as you can tell. Um, if you use that, it can generate multiple scatter plots for you, but it just kind of stacks them on top of each other. It doesn't have a nice arrangement. So you can see in the matrix of, you know, what is correlated to what. Um, you can build something like that. I think most people should build.
build their own templates because the Excel defaults, let's face it, suck. Uh, and I don't like their, you know, data palettes. Obviously, I use them, um, but, <laughs> you know, it's not ideal. Uh, I only have, I mean, I'm not getting paid for this, so I only spend so much time on this. I took, so this one here with the various blues, I took the tile grid map that John Schwabisch had made for policy viz, and it's an Excel spreadsheet. You can download it, put in your own numbers and do whatever. So I had something where you see where this number of the year is changing. There's a little drop down list that I can select and then poof, you know, it, it's its next thing. I take a snapshot and then I do the next one. And then <laughs> I take that stack of images and generate an animated GIF. And that's how I created this one. Um, but basically, I have a whole slew of these animated tile grid maps that come from a spreadsheet that just has a drop down box. It does a look up for the data. Um, this one is the regular New York, et cetera, et cetera. This is going to look a little different than the ones I've done for COVID. I've done ones for COVID because New York City is split off, and I also have Puerto Rico usually. Um, this one is, uh, and this one, sorry, this one is also omitting D.C. because D.C. has no representatives. It's not part of that 435 allocation. So, you know, I've been using a variety of spreadsheets uh, and reusing them. Uh, and here's that box plot. I do highly recommend if you are a data person, okay, and there are lots of good books. This is a good book. It's about the, the choices you make. No he doesn't really tell you how to do it practically. Uh, once you know the kind of graph you want to make, it's relatively easy to Google it, I mean, to search and find the graph you want to make. That's often what I do, especially since because of my job, I'm usually having to use Excel. Sometimes when I'm just doing it for myself, I can do it in R. There's you know, no, no big deal there. Um, and then various people have created templates. And yeah, I've actually paid money. Um, I actually paid money to John Schwabish for a pack of his uh, visualization tools. So let's see his stuff. Let's go to his shop. And I'll tell you what I bought and used. Yes, I bought the magic game just because I, I might use that at work once we're all back in the office. But yeah, like this U.S. Uh, Waffle Tile Grid Map, some of these um, graphic continuum desktop sheet, I've bought some of these for myself. So downloads, that's that's the one where I really, I've spent, I've spent money on this uh, because this is important to me. I have not necessarily used this on the blog. I, you know, I'm thinking through some of these things myself. Some of these are old. That's, that's just the truth. Some of these are for older versions of Excel and have been superseded, or I just don't like the way they look. I really don't like these waffle tile grid maps. I think they're too busy. That is my aesthetic opinion. Um, that said, I have a lot of things where I want to look, and you can see this on his, on his uh, front cover, is a lot of times it's spurring ideas. It's just like having writer's prompts. If you're a writer and you're just kind of stuck in wanting to have a start somewhere, uh, having a book of writer's prompts may be helpful. Or you know, it it's a reference. And this is and this is also why I like a book, printed material rather than an ebook. I have bought ebooks of various data visualization texts over the years. And I have had mixed results a lot of times because the books were originally formatted for print and therefore not optimized or they didn't change it for doing an ebook. It's a very different format and data viz people, just as it's very important to think about how a graph may look different if you're on a laptop versus an iPhone that might have a very small, you know, you're trying to make an impactful uh, graph, you might not be able to make fine distinctions. Some of the stuff that I've seen, I mean, you know, it's just too much detail. 
It's one thing if you're just trying to look up figures. It's another if you're trying to make a visual statement and communicate. Um, if they cannot see it, then what was the point of the data visualization? Okay, the whole point of data visualization as a communication technique is to present a message that people can see if they cannot see it. And that includes not being able to see it because they have visual problems. Like I, you know, like I can't actually, I can't read the screen if I have my glasses on. Um, like, ugh, I've got two pairs of glasses here. Like, mm, no, um, I usually have to take my glasses off to read, read computer screens now. Um, yeah, eventually I'll need bifocals. In any case, uh, you know, there's that. I know a lot of people who are colorblind or, you know, cannot distinguish between, between certain shades. And that is why this, this graph that I originally pulled from him had like a red to green uh, scale. And so I changed it to blue. I like blue. I've, I've used like black, I mean, gray to black. I've used reds. Um, I preferred trying to do a single shade continuum because first off, it's easier for me to extend to do in between colors if it's if it's just a whole shading spectrum versus hue. Um, you know, it, there's all practical things that we have to think about now. And then sometimes, like so here's here's one and there's six lines, so that might be almost too many. But what I wanted to emphasize, and I probably should have done this differently with the colors, maybe blue for the ones increasing like California, Texas, and Florida, and maybe black for the ones going down like New York, Pennsylvania, and Illinois. And these are the top six states for um, population in 2020. And we can see, you know, how much California has grown, Florida, and Texas, and how, you know, where was it speedy and where did they fall off? Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting to see those shifts over the years. Sometimes, you know, simple line graphs, Michigan, Michigan and New Jersey go up and then they go down. They have their peak in 1970, the height of the unionized uh, industrialization in kind of, you know, the mid north, etc. But of course, they lost ground in the 1970s into now. Georgia kind of was flat for a long time and then came back up. As Atlanta has grown, you can see since 1980, uh, and a lot of that growth is Atlanta, but also Savannah got cleaned up. I used to live there. Um, it is a lot nicer now than when I lived there. Uh, so, you know, those are things to think about. Um, <laughs> yeah, and there's other kinds of visualizations too. Uh, in any case, so, you know, check out these books. So I'll, I'll, I'll provide a link for this one. The old one, I'm sorry. It, it actually took me a lot. I could try to link to a page, but I won't even know. It might be, oh, it's $1,000. So I don't want to link to a page like that. Um, but the Better Data Visualizations, it's a new book out. Um, so go check that one out. I think it's got a lot of inspiration, a lot of ideas for those of us who are trying to communicate a, a quantitative message. And see you another time.